Oh, hey. Uh, you must be Seafara. Hell. Hydra? <laughs> oh, haven't heard that one before. You get my DVD message? Which one? The one you threw at my head? Or the one you replaced my copy of Green Lantern with? Replaced Green Lantern. That TV is actually propping up my tripod right now. Ah. How the hell did you manage to pull off that swap anyways? I know a guy. He leaves a trail of fire and brimstone behind him wherever he goes. That's gonna be the only explanation I'm gonna get, isn't it? Yep, now roll the intro. Okay, I know it's been like eight years since the movie came out, but they made a sequel? Don't get me wrong, I didn't hate the first Fantastic Four movie, but it didn't exactly blow me away and leave me clamoring for more when I first watched it. But sadly, the first movie made back over triple its $100 million budget, so 20th Century Fox greenlit a sequel. Which is what we'll be looking at today. But first, I think we'll be needing to give a little backstory on a certain Argent border that's going to be making its first cinematic appearance. Originally created in 1966 by the legendary team of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, Norman Mad, better known as the Silver Surfer, first appeared at the beginning of an issue Fantastic Four fans refer to as The Coming of Galactus. Galactus being an all-powerful eater of worlds who was also created by Jack Kirby and Stan Lee in 1966. The Surfer was an inhabitant of a utopian planet known as Den La, located somewhere in our own Milky Way galaxy. But he gave that up after bargaining his services with Galactus in exchange for the safety of his homeworld. This, in turn, changed the former Norrin into the Herald for Galactus, endowing him with the power cosmic so he could scout worlds for the cosmic being to consume. While he would become a recurring part in the Fantastic Four comics, he would finally get his own 18-issue series in 1968. His series would be rebooted three times, first in 1987, again in 2003, and once more in 2014. Alrighty then, with all that out of the way, let's talk about his first cinematic appearance. This is Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. The movie opens in space! Really? <laughs> eh, sorry, kinda had to get that out of my system. As I was saying, we open on an unknown planet being destroyed by a strange entity who most of the audience deduced as Galactus. And speaking as a longtime fan of Marvel's first family, I love this intro. The menacing feeling the movie gives off as Galactus annihilates the planet gives me hope that this was going to be an awesome experience. Sadly, it's all downhill from here. We then see a strange white light flying through space and land on Earth wreaking all kinds of havoc wherever he flies. Except, I don't think that's how his powers work. The guy has the power cosmic. He shouldn't be able to freeze water. Or change the weather. He isn't Storm. Cut to an airport in LA and we're reintroduced to our heroes, Reed Richards, Johnny and Sue Storm, and Ben Grimm. Sue gets a little upset when Reed starts showing interest in the anomalies occurring around the world when they should be focusing on their upcoming wedding. Reed then assures her that their wedding is his first priority. Okay, two things. Reed, you are whipped. Number two, whose bright idea was it to cast Jessica Alba as one of the strongest female superheroes in the Marvel Universe? Sue Richards is supposed to be caring, strong, independent, and not... Dude, save your rants. You're gonna need him for l Ugh, fine! We then cut to Latveria, the home of everyone's favorite evil scientist slash monarch, Dr. Victor Von Doom. Wait, how can you say his name normally now? Uh, people were kinda complaining that I overdid the whole <laughs> gag last episode. Ah, 
Makes sense. As I was saying, we cut to Laveria where the anomaly flies over what I assume is the Doom family estate, where I guess Doom was being held after being turned into a statue at the end of the last movie. The radiation emanating from the anomaly then proceeds to reanimate Doom. Show of hands, who didn't see that coming? Yeah, I didn't think so. Cut back to New York and Reed, Ben, and Johnny arrive at a local nightclub for Reed's bachelor party, where it turns out Johnny invited some female companions. No, 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 not those kinds. At least I don't think they are. They don't really explain. So after a painful dance number that gives me non-flashbacks to Spider-Man 3, Sue walks in with a group of government officials who are looking for Reed, led by General Hagar, played by Andre Brower, who then airs his doubts about wanting to work with a civilian scientist. Civilian scientist who just happens to be one of the greatest smart people in the world, you mean. You jackass. So, long story short, General I Am A Hard Ass drops some exposition about the anomaly and how it's creating massive craters around the world. He makes craters now too? All the Surfer is supposed to do is fly around the planet and summon Galactus. He does not make craters. So Hagar the Horrible asks Reed for some help building a sensor, but the request is turned down with Reed claiming his wedding takes priority. He's totally gonna build that sensor behind Sue's back, isn't he? Ah, uh, without a doubt. We then cut to the Baxter building where Reed is totally building the sensor behind Sue's back, which Ben and Johnny quickly find out about, but they both agree to keep it quiet. Finally, we cut to the day of the wedding, where after the entrances and the usual cameo from Stan Lee, it's revealed that Sue seems a little nervous. This isn't how I imagined it. Oh, uh, you'll be fine, just as long as Mephisto doesn't get involved. You're still bitter about one more day, aren't ya? You think? And after more of Sue's Bridezilla-esque drama, we find out Reed finished the censor almost overnight, claiming that any updates the censor gets on the anomaly will shoot a message over to his PDA. We then cut back to Latveria, where Doom is... somehow monitoring the satellite tracking the anomaly, and after he zooms in on it, it's revealed to be some kind of silver figure, which we discover is headed straight for New York. We then get a decent Sue and Johnny moment right before the wedding. This is actually really good character development. Or it would be if the two actually acted like brother and sister throughout the rest of the movie. So the wedding finally begins. Unfortunately, Reed's PDA keeps interrupting the ceremony, much to Sue's annoyance. Things go from bad to worse when the anomaly arrives in New York. I gotta say that New York landfall felt a little underwhelming. In the original comic, Uatu, the Watcher, comes down from space and warns the Fantastic Four of Galactus' impending arrival. I'm just saying I wish we had some kind of cosmic force warning everybody that something was coming. Maybe that's why Stan Lee was trying to get into the wedding. The hell are you talking about? You don't know about the fan theory people made about the Stan Lee cameos. What fan theory? I'm glad you asked. The ongoing fan theory towards every single Stan Lee cameo in the Marvel movies is that he's actually supposed to be Uatu the Watcher. That's great and everything, but I'm pretty sure that's headcanon at this point. Besides, Stan Lee trying to get into Reed and Sue's wedding is actually a homage to when Reed and Sue were actually trying to get married in the comics. Stan Lee and Jack Kirby were trying to break in, only to be turned away by Nick Fury. What? You think Linkara is the only superhero encyclopedia in the world? Fair enough. Anyway, the anomaly's arrival in New York triggers the massive EMP, which leads to one of the paparazzi helicopters crashing onto the roof of the Baxter building. Thankfully, Reed, Sue, and Ben manage to hold off any major carnage. Reed then asks Johnny to go after the anomaly as it passes overhead and a thrilling chase ensues. He quickly catches up after it passes through a building, and it's here where we're finally introduced to the Silver Surfer, physically played by Doug Jones and voiced by Lawrence Fishburne, as he phases out the other side of the building. Which is an impressive effect, but outside of having an infinity stone up his butt, this isn't really something he can do. They continue their chase for a little bit longer, until the Surfer suddenly stops, grabs Johnny by the throat, and flies him into the atmosphere, temporarily rendering him unconscious. Luckily, Johnny manages to wake up before going splat. 
and after a few moments where he can't transform, quickly changes back into the human torch and crashes somewhere in the Middle East. <laughs> Hey. Hey, Johnny. Johnny. Johnny, 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 Johnny. Ask me what day it is. If you tell me it's hump day, I swear to God I'm having roasted camel for dinner tonight. We then see the Silver Surfer finally summon Galactus, who won't be showing up for at least another hour, and then cut straight back to the Baxter building where Johnny explains what he saw. Ben's reaction's about how you'd expect it to be. Oh, no. Not at all. So, did you follow the shiny man to Lollipop Land or the Rainbow Junction? Look, I know what I saw. <laughs> Thank you. But Reed deduces that the surfer came to New York to disable the sensor he built. Johnny quickly excuses himself after feeling sick, and shortly after General Jackass leaves, Reed apologizes to Sue. Surprisingly, Sue is very understanding in one of the few moments where she's actually acting like her comic counterpart. But those hopes are quickly dashed when she starts whining about wanting a normal life. How could we possibly raise a family like this? Well, considering Reed initially lobotomizes one of the kids in order to save the world, and the other one was initially stillborn due to more radiation exposure during Sue's pregnancy, which caused her to turn inexplicably evil until Reed literally slapped the evil out of her, and then the lobotomized son brought back the stillborn baby, which Doom then tried to use as a weapon in order to try and fail to kill the Fantastic Four, I'm gonna go with not very well. Cut to Johnny, who passes out and falls into the street, right past a window that Sue happened to be walking by. She goes to check on him, but the second she tries to check his temperature... Cause you know it's gonna be so easy to find out if the Human Torch has a fever. They suddenly swap powers, with Sue bursting into flame and Johnny turning invisible when he tries to help his sister. Luckily, Reed manages to notice Sue's predicament, and after she explains what happened, deduces the only way to fix this is if Johnny causes another power transfer. Long story short, it works, but then we're reminded why Jessica Alba was most likely cast as Sue Storm. Hey, get out of there! Sue, your clothes! Why does this always happen to me? Well, I can think of a lot of good reasons off the top of my head, but I think they can be summed up by two words. Because, because giggity. giggity! Reed discovers that Johnny's encounter with the surfer somehow further mutated him, which caused him to temporarily switch powers with Sue. This prompts Ben to poke the bear with a stick, causing him to change back into almost normal, while Johnny becomes the thing. And I have to admit that while the power transfer subplot may be interesting at first, it just makes the movie seem a little bit more goofy than it needs to be. For one thing, there's the inconsistency, where Ben's voice changes, but Johnny's doesn't. And for another, this is supposed to be comedic irony for all the times Johnny has antagonized Ben for his mutation. After they switch their powers back, Reed decides to quarantine Johnny until they can figure out how to fix this. Sometime later, Johnny overhears Reed and Sue talking about hanging up their spandex as soon as the surfer crisis is over and getting married in secret. Oh, I can't see this leading to any kind of misunderstanding. Cut to Greenland, and Doom arrives at another crater to confront the surfer, who simply gives an ominous prophecy about the end before attempting to fly off. Doom doesn't take kindly to this, and fires off a bolt of electricity at him. Needless to say, the surfer doesn't take this too well, and fires Doom into a nearby glacier, which conveniently reverses his physical mutation. Back to the Baxter building, and Reed reveals he has a bit of bad news. He looked all over the galaxy for other stops the surfer may have made besides Earth, and it turns out that every planet he's landed on has basically died within eight days. Thankfully, Reed is able to use an algorithm to figure out where the surfer plans to set the next crater. London, England. Unfortunately, as Reed tries to lay out a plan on the way there, Johnny tells him to shove it, revealing that he overheard the entire conversation, and an argument ensues, much to the annoyance of General Hardass. Right, that's enough. We'll talk about this later. What the hell is wrong with you people? What the hell is wrong with them? They're the ones acting like normal people with emotions and stuff. We should be asking what the hell is wrong with you? Long story short, they make it to London just as the surfer begins to drain the Thames to create the next crater. This causes the nearby Eye of London to begin to fall apart. Thankfully, Sue, Ben, and Reed manage to slow down the Eye, but Johnny decides to try and be a hero when he sees the surfer fly off. Unfortunately, this leads to him crashing into Sue's force field and landing on Reed, forcing them to switch powers, which in turn causes Reed to let go of the eye. 
Thankfully, Reed is able to come up with a plan B and asks Ben to lift it a little higher so he can weld it back in place. Reed goes to check on Sue, but stops Johnny, telling him he's done enough. Back in the States, Hager chews them out and reveals that he's enlisted someone else to help. So, let me get this straight. You're gonna bring in Doom after you know what happened in the last movie. Are we sure that you're not the villain here? Regardless, the team reluctantly agrees to assist Doom, and he shows them the footage from his encounter with the Surfer in Greenland. They deduce that the only way to stop him is to separate him from his board, as it seems to be the source of his power. Except that it isn't. Sure is an interesting concept, and an original one at that. But here's the thing, the board is simply a method of transportation. It's not alive. Hell, there have been times in the comics where it's been damaged or destroyed, and he just recreates it without a hassle. So, after an admittedly nice scene of Ben and Johnny shooting the breeze at a bar, which displays some great character development for Johnny, showing that he isn't always an outright jerk, something much closer to his comic counterpart, and Reed manages to figure out a way to separate the surfer from his board thanks to an extremely forced conversation with Sue. Do you remember that time in school? A pulse. Tachyon Pulse. Oh, I love you. Oh, come on, Tachyon Pulse? What is this, Star Trek? Fast forward to another scene where Sue finds Doom tinkering with a strange device and tells him off for not helping Reed. Something the real Sue would do. And we cut to the Black Forest in Germany where General Jackass lives up to the nickname we just gave him and tells the team to just stick to the sidelines. I'm the quarterback. You're on my team. Got it? But I guess you never played football in high school. Reed, having had enough of the general's bullcrap, and in another moment very similar to his counterpart, steps forward and tears him a new one. Fifteen years later, I'm one of the greatest minds of the 21st century. I'm engaged to the hottest girl on the planet. And the big jock who played quarterback in high school, well, he's standing right in front of me asking me for my help. And I say he's not going to get a damn thing unless he does exactly what I tell him. And starts to. Ha ha! You tell him, Richard! Row, row, fight the power! Having been torn a new one by Reed, the general agrees to give them a one mile perimeter to set up Reed's tachyon pulse emitter, which requires the team to split up and install four posts in a very specific location. Most of them install their posts without a hitch, but Sue isn't as lucky as the surfer arrives on the scene. Sue tries to put up a force field, but it's revealed that the surfer can simply phase through it. So she tries to get some information out of him, but is interrupted when Doom tells Hagar to fire a warning shot across his nose. Careful, you idiot! I said across her nose, not up it! Sorry, sir. Doing my best. Unfortunately, the surfer doesn't take too kindly to this gesture and proceeds to blow up their trucks. Thankfully, Sue manages to finish installing her post just in time, and Reed activates the device, knocking the surfer off his board and causing him to lose his powers. Uh oh, looks like he's the tarnished silver surfer. I got some boat wax that should clear that up for you. Things are made worse for the surfer when Doom arrives on the scene and knocks him out before he can call back his board. Things are made worse when they arrive at a base in Siberia and the general orders the team to be confined while the surfer is questioned. They realize they need to get more information from the surfer so they devise a plan. First, Johnny distracts a guard. Thank you. Semper Fi. That's the Marine Corps. We're the Army. Give him four years. He'll learn the difference. And Zoo uses this opportunity to sneak out of the containment area to find the surfer. She manages to locate him, conveniently being left unguarded as Doom asks the general to speak to him in private. She asks the surfer why he's come to destroy Earth, and to explain it, surfer reveals another power. Belly television, or belly vision as I call it. It is known by many names. My people called it. Galactus. Wait, your people called it Galactus? I know it's a cosmic force, but you know what? 
this scene gets a pass because it actually caused me to squee when I was watching it in the theaters. The Surfer also reveals that he serves Galactus in order to spare his world from being destroyed, and that Galactus is following a signal in his board and will arrive in a few hours. He never specifically states how long, and it kind of just goes all timey-whiny. Timey what? Timey-whiny? I've, I've no idea where he picks that stuff up. Oh, and the movie uses this to show that Galactus has entered our solar system, showing his shadow as he passes Saturn. Further inside the base, it's revealed that General Dumbass promised Doom that he could have the Surfer surfboard for experimentation under his supervision. Doom's totally gonna kill him, isn't he? What? Call it. Never trust anyone with the last name of Doom. The General tries to stop Doom by shooting at him, but that does little more than annoy him as he kills the General without hesitation. Some quarterback you are. Hey! Hey, Hagar! Hagar! Lace is out! Hey, nice Ace Ventura reference. Why, thank you very much. Doom then proceeds to mount the board and gains the power cosmic. Sorry, can I say something again? Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, yes, Doom stealing the surface powers actually happened in the comic. But the thing is, the powers do not come from the surfboard. It comes from the power cosmic that was given to him by Galactus himself, not from the surfboard. Why is that so hard to figure out? Why is this movie messing things up so much? Why, why, why? Okay, I'm done. Thank you. The group realizes that they need to get the board back if they have any hope of saving Earth from Galactus, but Ben points out that he has no way of catching up to Doom. Reed tells him he's got it, hits a few buttons, and they go break the surfer out. They then make a break for the roof to find the Fantastic Car waiting for them. <laughs> you okay there? <clears throat> Sorry, it's just, it's really cool to see the Fantastic Four flying in the Fantastic Car with the Human Torch flying alongside him. No matter how crappy the movie is, that scene is just really, really cool. The team flies off to China where Doom is headed. Unfortunately, he doubles back and intercepts them, taking out Johnny in the process. Realizing how much trouble they're in, Reed pushes a button, separating the Fantastic Car into three segments, and they split up to try to avoid getting blown out of the sky by Doom. Johnny quickly joins back up again, but Doom responds by unveiling his secret weapon. Let's all go for I hate when phenomenal cosmic power turns supervillains into pun machines. The ensuing bad pun attack sends the team crashing into downtown Shanghai, and Doom doubles back towards Sue and the Surfer, ready to kill. Sue steps in the way and tries to throw up a force field to protect them, but forgets that the power of cosmic had allowed the Surfer to pass through her shield before, so... Shot through the heart! And Doom's to blame, he gives villainy a bad name. Things go from bad to worse for both the characters and the audience when it arrives. Don't you mean he? No, I mean it, because, well... Stand back! There's a hurricane coming through! Thanks? Maybe later. Reed deduces that Doom must have his own pulse device keeping him connected to the board, but in order to do so, it would take the entire team. And maybe just one of us. Yeah, right, and maybe I'll be a super scroll. To quote a friend of mine, it's clobbering time. <laughs> you were saying? I will say this though. While this is kind of a crowning moment for Johnny's character, it almost comes completely out of nowhere. Yeah, there were plot points about Johnny not being able to work as part of a team, and of course he still has the ability to transfer powers at this point, but up till now, there's been no indication that he could even take on all four powers at once. For all we know, this could have just led into some big superpower roulette. I mean, it didn't, but still, you can't just introduce a gamble like this without Johnny giving even a throwaway line about wanting to try taking on all four powers at once. Hell, even the supernova ability he used to defeat Doom in the last movie was hinted at earlier then. 
Either way, Johnny beats the ever-loving crap out of Doom and eventually shorts out the pulse device, while Ben knocks him into the ocean using a nearby crane he commandeered. Unfortunately, there's no time to celebrate as Sue then dies in Reed's arms. Okay, raise your hands again if you know what happens next. So after the surfer uses one of his actual powers to heal Sue's wound, he flies into the eye of Hurricane Galactus with the help of Johnny. He arrives at the eye and tells the flaming Galactus head, No! That is still not Galactus! Not good enough, movie! Not good enough! <clears throat> As he was saying, the surfer arrives at the eye and essentially tells the flaming Galactus head that he quits and proceeds to use all of his vaguely established powers to kill the Hurricane. Which basically dooms the entire universe, because killing Galactus summons Abraxas, a being whose sole purpose is to destroy all of reality. Way to go, a-hole! After that, we roll the epilogue. Johnny finds out his ability to transfer powers is now gone, the team decides not to disband, Reed and Sue finally get married at a local shrine, Holy Venice is sinking into the Adriatic. Oh boy, that's a biggie. Can we just skip to the end? Albeit it was a brief ceremony that was about as legal as Humperdinck's marriage to Buttercup. Never happened. What? Never happened. But it did. I was there. This old man said man and wife. Did you say I do? Oh no. Sort of skipped that part. Then you're not married. And the team flies off in the Fantastic Car, once again forming the team's logo with their smoke. Or in Johnny's case, Flame Trails. So, that was fantastic. Whoa. What? It's the end of the movie. You forgot the sequel, begging. That's all fine and dandy, but there was no sequel. While this movie did do fairly well, making back a little over double its $130 million budget, and it was slightly more accepted by critics, according to Rotten Tomatoes, Fox opted not to make a sequel, but decided to go for a reboot, which as of this recording is going to be released in August of this year. Alright, you have a point there. Let's take a closer look at Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer. Galactus Cloud aside, this movie is... okay. It's not the worst Fantastic Four movie. That title belongs to the Corman fiasco from the mid-90s. But it's not the best one either. This movie tries to grab the characters from the comic, and though there are some sparks of the source material here, it ultimately falls flat on its face. This movie, and the other early 2000s comic movies fall under the same We're afraid to embrace the source material fear. Thankfully, studios have begun to embrace the source material and give us a good story at the same time. That's all we really want from our comic book movies. For a long time, comic movies sucked, and this movie is sadly what killed the Fantastic Four for the better part of a decade. It remains to be seen how the new Fantastic Four does. Let's hope it does well, because Marvel's first family really needs a shot in the arm after having movies that suck. The Fantastic Four can work as a movie series. I think you pretty much hit the nail on the head with that. As for me, someone who had very little exposure to the team outside of the mid-90s cartoon, I didn't like this for different reasons. Most of the time, a lot of these characters kind of came off as jerks, be it Johnny antagonizing Ben and vice versa, Sue's constant whining about wanting a normal life, and just about everything that General Hagar did. The only characters I felt I could get behind were Ben's girlfriend Alicia, the Silver Surfer, and believe it or not, Reed. Sure, Reed's awkwardness and the fact that he acted kind of whipped at the beginning was a little off-putting, but compared to everyone else who only had a few scenes where they came off as likable, some more than others, he was one of the more consistently written characters. While the Silver Surfer was another Marvel hero that didn't interest me that much as a kid, the way Lawrence Fishburne and Doug Jones brought him to life made me care about what happened to him as the story progressed. And Alicia? Well, she's pretty much the same. Likeable character has pretty much been Ben's, pardon the pun, rock. It's a shame that she was just relegated to the wedding scene, especially since, in the comics, it was her who convinced the Silver Surfer to save the planet, not Sue. But the biggest joke here is Fox screwing up the premise for an awesome second movie, leading into an even awesomer third movie. 
You could have had the second movie be all about the Silver Surfer arriving and heralding the appearance of Galactus, do the whole Doom plot here, have Galactus appear at the end to set up for the third movie, and then make that about the team's battle with Galactus. The real Galactus, not that stupid hurricane. Speaking of which, remember you asked me if I wanted to rant about Galactus? You want to do it now, don't you? Alright, shield card! Go ahead, I'm gonna breathe me some Ghibli while this is going on. Thanks. That is not Galactus. This is Galactus. Galactus is not a cloud. Even in the Ultimate Universe, he was a swarm of bugs or something. Not a cloud. In the comics, it has been revealed that as a force of nature, Galactus takes on the form of the dominant life form of the planet he is about to devour. For example, if he was to devour a Klingon world, he'd look like a Klingon. Here, he's a cloud. Formless. This would only work if humans were clouds. And we're not. We're solid beings. So it stands to reason that Galactus should look like us. Yes, I'm aware that the writers and the director of this movie wanted a more alien Galactus, and that the purple headgear of the comics looks kind of silly. But the thing is, we were told that Galactus was a he. We were never given any indication that he was a cloud or something. We were given his shadow several times. The shadow was humanoid, and this hooked us all in. The movie teased us with a possible image of Galactus, and it pulled the lung out from under us. This is why so many comic fans hate this movie. We were promised Galactus after seeing a humanoid silver surfer, and this movie does not deliver. Amen to that. Hey, thanks for finally getting in on this crossover. Anytime. As for me, I got my own stuff to work on. I'm Sue Farrow, and I'll see you in the funny pages. And of course, I'm the Hipster Ninja. And next time, we finally tackle something from DC. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Very sorry about the length, but there was a lot we had to cover with this movie. If you guys liked what you saw, go ahead and subscribe, leave a comment, let us know what you think. If you guys would like to follow us on Twitter, I am at KiraKennedyHNR, and Seafara is at Seafara1227. If you'd like to check us out on Tumblr, I am KiraKennedyHNR.tumblr.com, and Seafara is StarboltProductions.tumblr.com. And of course, if you'd like to check out any of our past work, you can check out my stuff at PeanutButterDisaster.com, and Seafara's work at RTGomer.com. Also, Seafara makes a really cool fan comic, which you can check out at starbolts.blogspot.com. So until next time, I'm Kira Kennedy, and thank you for watching. Peanut butter disaster. <laughs>